Welcome to Medical Marijuana and Wellness. Today's topic is improving sleep with medical marijuana, and I'm joined by Dr. Greg Holt. Uh, Dr. Holt, welcome. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I was a PhD from the University of Florida College of Medicine in Physiology, and I'm a clinical sleep specialist from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, and currently the president of the Texas Society of Sleep Professionals, and I work with ALS patients with mechanical ventilation right now. That's great. So you have a little experience with sleep. Absolutely. And working with patients. Um, I should point out that uh, this presentation is for information purposes only. Naturally, if you're going to seek any medical advice, please consult your physician. I also want to mention that uh, Dr. Holt and I have just finished doing a Understanding and Optimizing Sleep video, which you can find in this channel, which you might find very interesting. It's uh, something that delves deeper into the subject of sleep and how it can help you and how you can improve your sleep. So, Dr. Holt, the duration and the quality of sleep really is related to your health. Yes, it is. Uh, when you look at the far left, uh, recommended sleep, uh, you can see that you need more sleep the younger you are. Uh, and that's true. The, the worst part about it is everybody in the middle that's getting a reduced amount of sleep these days because of um, either the video gaming that's going on, social interaction, social media, they are shortening their sleep uh, because of uh, a lot of other things that seem to be going on in their life. And that's something that has to be stressed through uh, good parenting about shutting it down and trying to get everybody to get the right amount of sleep. Yeah, I think that's really important. You mentioned especially uh, younger folks, they're like sponges, but I think also for seniors, it's important to get that seven to, seven to nine hours of sleep as well. Yeah, when you get older, of course, more pathologies happen. And if they influence your sleep uh, and the sleep staging, Older folks still need that uh, deep stages of sleep for restorative sleep. They need good REM sleep for psychological health. Uh, and they can't break up their sleep to like one hour here and there and start sleeping off and on all day. You know that there's some something underlying going on. So right. getting that sleep all into one big pile is important. A, a short nap, as long as it doesn't affect your sleep onset later that night, is always okay. You know, and the younger, younger people, the babies, to get two or three naps a day, and that's good, that's normal, that's fine. Uh, but in general, to have all of your sleep put together, not trying to like uh, catch up on sleep on the weekends, reduce the amount of sleep during the week, all of those things are, are bad for your health. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And really, when you look at your immune system, your neurons really help you help control sleep. You know, they do. There's like uh, certain groups of cells inside the brain that are, are, are situated to like help with wake state and situated to help with, with sleep state. So it's like being on a seesaw where you have a bigger hand on one side of the seesaw and you will be in wake state, uh, neurons that are in like the frontal cortex. And then some of the deeper uh, sites uh, could be for sleep state. So they all interact together. One suppresses the other to make sure that you're in a wake state, to make sure you're in a sleep state. And when there's any kind of disruption on those two, that's where you can have sleep waking disorders like narcolepsy, mm -hmm. where you can fall asleep in an instant with things like things that surprise you. And then you're out in a, in a, a, a conscious, but a, it appears like you're in a sleep state. So it's a, it's a very interesting sleeping disorder, but definitely important. Yeah. And, and your immune system uses sleep to be able to really refresh and strengthen itself. Um, you mentioned there's cytokines also that come into play here. Yeah. Cell active substances that are, are running around inside the body. You know, cytokines are important for everything we do to like signal uh, some kind of like a, a foreign invader is coming into the body. And those cytokines sort of signal to the body what's going on with each other. So um, all, everything that goes on inside the body can be affected by being reset, refreshed, and ready to respond to things like infection. Right. Now, when you have some sort of a mental or physical disorder, that can affect your sleep. You know, it's hard to tell sometimes which one comes first when you're talking about sleeping disorders and some of these other disorders like you have listed here. Sometimes the, the sleeping disorder can precede things like anxiety and depressive states. And sometimes you end up with like different conditions that, that can end up having problems. And when you look at even cancer, cancer with extreme intractable pain, that shows up on a sleep as first shows up as arousals with this alpha intrusion 
that can cause fatigue during the day, but more and more of that alpha intrusion you, and less good quality sleep, you can become sleepy during the day. Sure. So when you look at why we sleep, one of the, one of the reasons is basically to survive. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, there's something called fatal familial insomnia, where you could be awake for about three months and then you'll die. So definitely found out that, you know, that you need to have sleep to survive. But the brain, when it's in an active wake state, it's discharging a lot. Different neurons mm -hmm. are firing things to keep the body moving, keep the body thinking, to do all these kind of processes and, and nice rapid discharging but that can't keep up forever. So it's got to reset itself. So when it goes into the sleep state, the, the neurons are resetting themselves, taking up some of that uh, neurotransmitter kind of stuff they release during the awake state and getting ready for the next awake state. So uh, critically important to have yeah. sleep that's combined what, with awake state. That's what we're pointing out here. It's kind of like uh, rebooting the computer. That's what your, your system is doing. It's absolutely, absolutely what you're doing. It also helps us grow and heal. Yeah, when we look at um, circadian phasing, we can reference circadian phasing to even the circadian phasing of hormone release, so like growth hormones uh, are released in the first third of the night in deep sleep. So when you have deep sleep, you get growth hormone release and it helps you to like um, grow normally like you're supposed to. So without good sleep, sometimes, you know, even growth could be stunted. Sure. Now, when we take a look at sleep, it's really, sleep has more of a dynamic state than, than a, con it, it's something that you go through phases. Yeah, well, that's one of the common misconceptions about sleep is that once you're asleep, it's just there, you know, the things aren't happening inside the body. And that's not true because you move through different brainwave patterns that are either a deeper pattern or a lighter pattern, like a REM sleep is a lighter pattern where the EEG almost resembles the awake state. And in deep sleep, you can very much tell that, you know, it's hard to arouse people from a deep sleep. So there's a lot of things happening there too. And you can see things like pain on the EEG pattern where you get this fast 10 cycle per second cycling called alpha delta sleep or alpha intrusion. You can actually see chronic pain on the EEG and know that they need to treat that to help treat their wake state functioning. And you mentioned it, and it's been mentioned that pain and anxiety are really the main reasons why people have trouble sleeping. Yeah, you know, uh, they have trouble getting to sleep. And then if they wake up, they have wake after sleep onset insomnia. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are problems all over the place. Anxiety, psychological problems are something that, you know, you need to deal with during the wake state so that you will sleep a little bit better. Right. And so when you define what sleep really is, it's uh, you had a good definition of that. Uh, why don't you give me that one one, one more time? You know, when you're thinking of like a sleep, remember that, you know, you have, you have sleep, wake, and then you have loss of consciousness. And loss of consciousness is not the same as restorative sleep. So you, you have to look at the EEG waveform if you're trying to define sleep. So if you're awake and you have your eyes closed, you know you're not asleep. But somebody else looking at you is like, well, he's not moving. He must be asleep. And so you have to have that EEG component with it to tell that somebody's asleep and, and not faking it. You can't fake sleep once you have the EEG on somebody, uh, but very different. So you have to, you know, when we put somebody in the sleep lab, there's like 16 sets of electrodes on them. And we can really tell what's going on with you. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So. When you want to treat insomnia, you know, it's interesting from my perspective that insomnia is really suffered by 64 million people here in the United States. You know, if you have insomnia, you're not alone. And the interesting part also is that uh, ladies are more susceptible to it. And also, it's also seniors are more susceptible to it. But Dr. Holt, how do you treat it? Now, now the, the first thing to do is to identify and think to yourself of why you're having trouble getting to sleep. If you took a two hour nap during the day, but you can't go to sleep, you know, at your usual bedtime of 10 o'clock, you should be aware that a two hour nap, you're not going to go to sleep at your normal bedtime, but it'll be delayed by one or two hours. So that's an easy way to figure out. If you drank, oh, the easiest patient I ever had at the sleep lab was like, what do you do before you go to sleep? She had problems with reflux and insomnia. She goes, I drink a quart of sweet iced tea. It's like, oh, really? Don't do that. And then she found out, you know, she and never had to come back. Everything worked out. She just called in the office and saying, I'm all right. So yeah. 
you look for any kind of pathology, underlying disorders, medications, behavioral issues. If you look at number three there under treating insomnia, mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy is a CBT. When you're looking at behavioral therapy, you try to fix what you might be doing wrong during the day to help you get to sleep better at night. Sure. Interesting. Now, you also have an, an, an Epsworth scale, which uh, folks can get in this video uh, down below you, what you'll find is that you'll get a link to the Epsworth scale. Uh, tell me about that, because that's a good indicator, to, at least a place to start to help you figure out how to get better sleep. Yes, yeah, it's it's pretty much what we got. Um, you know, it, sleep is like pain. You get a subjective uh, interpretation of it. It's like, how much pain are you in, sir? It's like a zero to 10. He was like, I'm a seven today. It's like, okay, you're in a lot of pain, I see. But how do you really know? It's, it's the same thing with sleep. How sleepy are you? Well, I'm so sleepy that I could fall asleep right away. Uh, you know, and here we've got like a, a zero to 23, I believe it is. It's like, mm -hmm. if you're higher than 10, then we think that you've got some excessive daytime sleepiness going on right. that we need to look at. But if you look at those that list of things, and it says like um, stopping for a few minutes in traffic while dry, driving, it's like, well, I don't drive, I don't have a car, I'll put zero here. But you can see how some people would falsely lower their number and look like they're not sleepy. So, But this is what we got for some general things and what people do. So if you if you know that you doze off at a red light, if you've ever driven off the road to sleep, those are the people we see in the clinics like faster than anybody else. Sure. And again, you'll have a link to this particular uh, to to, uh, to this particular uh, scale to be able to click on that link and be able to download this this particular chart. So let's talk about cannabis. Let's talk about medical marijuana and see how it really helps. What's interesting is there's been a number of studies done on sleep, and it really has a, it, the endocannabinoid system has a major role with the circadian rhythms that go with, go on within the body. That whole wake and sleep cycle. Uh, they have found that the, the ECS, the endocannabinoid system, also supports your sleep, your sleep function, and really causes a lot of the your body to um, make itself better, to heal itself, and be able to control itself. Um, and THC also has some sedative properties with respect to to can to um, to helping you sleep. Uh, Dr. Holt, you had mentioned something about cannabis being a very effective method uh, for being able to address sleep. Yes, I I think it you know it's got like a a lot of good properties that haven't been well studied because like we were talking about for, uh, at first, it's because it's still a Schedule One drug in the United States and it makes it. Uh, frightening to study something that, that could actually put people in jail. So that's been like a, a big in, inhibition to this entire thing. But with it opening up recreationally and medicinally, you're, we're finding out more. It's like, well, whatever I, I, I took, you know, the other night put me to sleep right away. So anecdotal evidence started turning, is starting to turn into like sleep studies to find out that it does reduce sleep onset latency and put you to sleep faster, so to speak. Yeah, so, and I should point out that a lot of sleep studies are being done outside of the United States where it is legal in places like Israel, Canada, uh, England, Germany, uh, Spain. Uh, we're finding that there is a lot of sleep research going on with respect to medical cannabis. Unfortunately, we're just behind the eight ball here in the United States. We really got to catch up to the world and get our get our legislation correct. You know, when you're looking at the endocannabinoid system, like 35 years ago when I had the first two years of medical school at UF, we didn't talk about this, you know, that wasn't even something to look at. And it wasn't something that we said that there are CBD receptors inside the, the body. Uh, this wasn't even mentioned. And I don't know that it's mentioned at all these days either. And some of the claims that are made about medical marijuana may or may not be true that I'm not sure I haven't read any studies like reducing sleep apnea events. I can't say that it does, except I, I would say that because the molecule resembles tricyclic amines like protriptyline or vivactyl, uh, that it reduces REM sleep. And if mm -hmm. you have REM dependent sleep apnea or more uh, apnea events may be um, demonstrated, if you suppress REM, you suppress REM apnea, surely it could be true. Some people use uh, things like um, protriptyline off label to suppress REM sleep, to suppress REM sleep apnea. And I don't think it's right because, you know, you're using a medication to stop sleep apnea, but that's a true statement. But, you know, 
the application of it to me isn't isn't done the right way. I wouldn't I wouldn't smoke marijuana to stop sleep apnea is what I'm trying to say. That's good. That's a good point. It is important though to put both THC and CBD together if you really want to address sleep. Um, what's also found is, and this is, goes one of those anecdotal studies that in Colorado, when recreational cannabis was approved, um, it was found that sleep aids uh, sales fell over 200%. People not only started using, but they recognized the effectiveness of using cannabis for sleep. Yeah, you know, absolutely right. And I think that um, medical marijuana for sleep onset is probably a lot safer than a lot of the medications that are used. You know, you can have some liver issues associated with things like Benadryl long-term, certainly yeah. things like alcohol, you know, uh, 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 for an acute form of insomnia, I think medical marijuana has a, a, a better kind of efficacious effect than some of the things that you saw over the counter. And a lot of those over the counter medicines are Benadryl based diphenhydramine. So it's not a good idea long-term for sure. In fact, to me, any kind of medication long-term for chronic insomnia means that you haven't looked into it enough to find out what you need to try to do. Of course, there are people that are on chronic medications. I'm not saying it's horrible. I'm just saying that if you haven't looked at everything to improve your sleep behaviorally and any kind of underlying medical condition, then you, you, you're not doing it the right way. Sure. That's really interesting. And also, again, I'm going back to the fact that there are studies that have been done that really relate the endocannabinoid system directly to sleep. And it helps you be able, and the endocannabinoid system is something that helps you control your mood, your appetite, uh, your circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are very important. Yes, yeah, circadian phasing, critical. You know, you have to have the, you have to be for the right sleep onset. You have to be on the down slope of the circadian phase and you have to have enough sleep pressure built up that you can see in that other uh, video to mm. fall asleep naturally. So you to be able to fall asleep naturally, those two things, sleep pressure and circadian phasing, have to be lined up to fall asleep naturally. And a medication like medical marijuana, done the right way with the right combination for you as an individual, will help you push you over that edge to fall asleep. And CBD has been known to decrease the both anxiety and pain and what's interesting is the uh, uh, American Sleep Association found out that consuming medical cannabis uh, gives you significant improvements in insomnia. And so, um, again, it's been studied both anecdotally as well as in the labs. And you'll find that uh, it is an effective mechanism for being able to address sleep. Now, one of the, peop one of the things people ask me all the time is why is cannabis such a big deal? Uh, we all know that we all have a nervous system. And we know that if we hurt our finger, bang our knee, something happens in our body, uh, our, we, our nervous system communicates that to our brain, says, Houston, we have a problem, and then Houston recognizes that. That we all knew it was in existence. But as you mentioned, Greg, what they have just found when they started studying medical cannabis, especially the last, uh, let's say the last couple decades, is they found that we also have an endocannabinoid system, which is helps your body manage itself and stay in what they call homeostasis and stay in balance. This is the part of your body that manages pain, anxiety, memory, inflammation, um, uh, a whole bunch of things like, like appetite. ECS is really, when you say, Houston, we have a problem, where did Houston hand the problem to? It handed it to the endocannabinoid system. Now, this is fairly new. Is that correct? As far as uh, knowledge to the medical profession. It's being studied more. I mean, it used to be underground studies looking at, um, they, they were calling it anandamide in like 1980s research and, and early in that. So they could hide the fact that it was like cannabis related research. But now when they looked at receptors inside tissues of the body, they found collections of receptors for the endocannabinoid system. And when they found these collections of receptors in the body, of, well, they must be doing something. They must be communicating somehow. And they probably do interact with the different cytokines inside the body and with uh, the nervous system to either tune up how fast the, you know, the, the, the communication signals, the action potentials go down and move back towards the brain. So there's probably a lot of interaction with what can go on in the endocannabinoid system. And this is very important. This, this knowledge is very important to help people, especially when you're addressing sleep. The other thing I want to point out is that when you look at CBD, 
they talk about the C the CB1 and CB2 receptors. CBD also affects a lot of other receptors. It's like a super vitamin for your body. Now, some of which um, have to do with you mentioned sleep, your blood pressure, and that type of thing. You know, you can see a lot of things in here, like this COX-2 is cyclooxygenase, you know, cyclooxygenase inhibitors, when you're talking about aspirin, things like that, you know, with like reducing inflammation, reducing pain. So if you see that CBDA has an effect on the COX-2 receptors, I think you're talking directly about some kind of like pain reduction uh, that, that's in there. Right. The 5-HT is serotonin like uh, receptors down at the bottom. You're looking at all kinds of things in there that can help control some of the uh, the release and uh, uptake of serotonin. So there's a lot of things in there too. You know, if it has an effect on these types of receptors, then you know it has a certain physiologic effect that needs to be studied so we can figure out exactly which one is doing what. Sure. I mean, when we say that we think medical marijuana can help with sleep, we're beginning to find through studies, we're beginning to understand exactly why. And I think that's very, very important. Now, I should point out, when I got involved in cannabis 10 years ago, we heard about indicas and sativa. Indica was relaxing, sativa was more energizing. And that really has almost all gone away because a lot of the producing production of the product today is not only looking at the kind of strains that we're using, but also what they call the terpenes. And we'll talk about terpenes in a minute. The terpenes provide the medical efficacy of medical cannabis. And what's going on today is a lot of the dispensaries, a lot of the producers are matching the terpene profiles and strains to a particular condition. And when they do that, they create what they call cultivars or chemotypes that we're being able to breed or being able to put together products that address things like sleep. Uh, for example, there's a, a company, uh, Sutera Wellness, that has a product called Dream. It's made specifically to help people sleep at night. So we know that in the area of medical cannabis, there are processes going on. There are production going on to really address various conditions. Again, sleep is one of them. And I, Greg, you mentioned earlier, I think it's important to point out, it's important to get your dosing correct. Uh, getting the right dosing, your body will tell you when you are at the right therapeutic level. I'm not going to jump in too much on dosing because we have a webinar on that. Please go to our YouTube channel and, and watch that one. It'll help you figure out your sweet spot. But that is really critical to effectively use medical cannabis. Now, a lot of people ask, are terpenes important? And the answer is yes. This is where the medical properties, this is where the medical benefits of cannabis come into play. And I do want to point out, these are the main terpenes. There are over, right now we know that there are over 150 different terpenes in cannabis. We know there are 100 of them being studied. But this is kind of the, the top list of ones that really affect sleep. We know that periophylline, myrcene, miracol, we know that linalol, pinene, uh, terpenolone and liminal, limonene all help with sleep. And so if you're looking at using medical cannabis, when you're talking to the dispensary, ask if they have this terpene profile. If they do, the product you're buying will in fact help you with sleep. If in fact they don't have this terpene profile or some of these terpenes in there may not be as effective uh, for sleep as what you'd really, really, really like. Now, I also wanna point out that there are also and oops, let me back up a little bit. There's a number of what they call cultivars. I mentioned earlier, people are, a lot of dispensaries are making products to address sleep. And you can see there's a number of what they call the strains that you'll hear about, uh, the granddaddy purples, the, the Northern Lights, the OG Kushes, the, the blueberries, purple Kushes, that actually uh, look at really helping you with sleep. And that really comes from, if you look at the terpene profiles, it goes back to having the right terpenes that are in there. You've seen this in some of your, in, with some of your patients, is that correct? Well, not in the sleep lab, but um, I love this slide because to me, this is like, a, it, it started out because, you know, the more people that are using it and the more people that are familiar with terpenes and terpene profiles give feedback. And so you can look at it all like anecdotal evidence, but if you have 400,000 people that say this combination of terpenes makes me sleepy, and relax, you're going, all right, we got something with that many guys saying the same thing. And that's where, you know, everything in here needs to be like added to where you're looking in research to say that, okay, I know where the receptors are. I know what's being activated and not being activated. And yes, yes, it is related to a reduced sleep onset latency. And then it, it, then it makes it a, a relatively safe 
medication like medical marijuana for sleep more effective and backed up by science and i think that's where everybody is pushing for now it's like all right you know we've got a lot of like uh we got a lot of points highlighted from a lot of people that say what it does so let's um let's let's make sure that it does exactly what we believe it does based on the terpenes so yeah, and I, I agree with you it's time to it's time here in the united states to start doing more research in the medical cannabis and really trying to help the millions of people that can be helped by this particular form of, of, of this alternative or this option people have yes. um, so let's let's talk i'm going to go back for one i went through that very quickly we hear about one of the cannabinoids called CBN, and CBN is really uh, kind of interesting because it's really known to help with sleep, and that's because it is really high in a lot of the terpenes, like the linalols, the myrcenes, and humulenes. The nice part about CBN is it isn't really as in, it's not intoxicating like CBD, or excuse me, like THC. Um, it, it's much safer. It's much easier to use, and if you look at it, you can actually find. CBN in a lot of the medical cannabis products that you're looking for. So again, when you talk to the dispensary, ask them about the terpene, excuse me, the strain profile, but also so you try to find out if the right cannabinoids, if CBN is one of the cannabinoids that's in the product that you're taking a look, take a look at. Uh, so it's something to pay attention to. Excellent. Yes. Routes of administration are also important. One of the nice things about cannabis is it's not like you take two pills and I'll see you in the morning. There's a number of different ways of using it. Um, you can take it, uh, I find the most uh, easiest way to use it is sublingual drops where you just drop it underneath your tongue. It takes about 10 to 20 minutes to work and it'll work between four to six hours. And that goes the same for sprays. You can actually have a spray that goes on the inside of your mouth and is absorbed by the blood vessels. Greg, you've seen, you've seen that as a way of providing medicine, providing it sublingually is really important. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it avoids what's called the first pass effect. Like if you look at nitroglycerin, sublingual nitro for angina or chest pain, you know, cardiac related chest pain, you put it underneath the tongue so it doesn't go through the liver and be broken down before it gets to the coronary arteries surrounding the heart. And that's what you're trying to target. So if you're sure. trying to relax the coronary arteries to get more blood flow to the heart to relieve that chest pain, uh, swallowing that pill is not good. It's not going to work, you know, for what you need. But right. so you really look at some of these things on how fast they work and uh, the duration of action for sure. Now, uh, I know that when people are starting to use medical cannabis or people are using medical cannabis, the key is to be able to find your therapeutic level of relief. More is not necessarily better, but you'll be able to find that as you're using cannabis, you take, for example, sublingual drops are the best way to start taking just that first line on the eyedropper, 0 0.125 milliliters. Uh, you may not feel anything, go up to 0 0.5. By increasing that, you'll, you'll feel better. Your body will tell you exactly how it's working. And when you take a little bit too much, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll feel anxiety. You won't feel as well. That's when you back down and you found your therapeutic level of relief. Sublingual That's drops right. are really the best way to, really best way to do that. It's the easiest way to do that. And that and was a because, problem with the original medications like Marinol, which has yeah. 5,000 times the affinity for the receptors than, than, than anything else that's out there that, you know, is natural, like a natural flower. And people say that it just like inca incapacitates me. I hate it, won't do it. You know, they'd rather smoke one or two puffs off of something and get a titrate to the desired effect and not just blast their entire body. So, right. uh, you know, Proper dosing, figuring out what works for you, trying not to overdo it and build yourself up to like getting that therapeutic range uh, right. is what you're looking for. And, you know, and you, you mentioned, you mentioned inhalation. Let's tackle that one for a second. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, gee, I'll just smoke a joint and I'll feel a lot better. Um, what's interesting is uh, terpenes, which we talked about earlier, are extremely sensitive to temperature. So if you yeah, take yeah. that 500 degree flame, and you light that blunt, you light that, you light that joint, what you're doing is you're burning off about half of the cannabinoids, um, you're burning off all the terpenes, most of the flavonoids, so you're reducing the efficacy of that particular joint or that blunt down about 50 to 60 percent. That's the bad news. You're looking, news here, yeah, definitely breaking open those, uh, the molecular structure of a lot of what's going on for sure, but everybody knows there is some effect there. So when you switch from like one dosage of one type 
a delivery method to another dosage of a different type of delivery method, they will not be the same. True. Very right. true. Right. And that's really, that's why the using concentrates where you drop cannabis into a, a vape pen, you can control the temperature. And you'll find in these, in these pens, you'll find a low, medium, and high setting. And so if you set it to, like, for example, low, you'll be getting a lot of the terpenes that are needed for or, or really help with sleep. That's why in, when you take inhalation, I really look at uh, vape pens and concentrate pens as the way to go. And that's why they've really been developed. You also want to mention that topicals are important. I know I, I have a herniated disc in my neck. And I find that putting on a topical works almost immediately, and I get one to two hours of relief. And then also one of the famous ones is oral um, edibles. The, the gummies, the chocolates, uh, capsules, they take between uh, an hour or two, two hours potentially to work. They'll last a long time. So, for example, in the evenings, if you want to get sleep during the night, I, I, use a, I take some chocolate uh, just before bed, and it helps me sleep through the night. But it does take a couple hours to work. But Greg, you got to be really careful of edibles because of the fact it has to metabolize in the system. Yeah, you know, after you eat it, you can't take it back generally, you know. So you really have to be careful with the dosing and then wait out the, the entire time to see how long it lasts, how long it takes you for that dose and, uh, and try to work your way around that, you know. Yeah. And, and always when you're new on any kind of medication, uh, you know, Try not to be active doing something that could uh, end up like a, you know, a motor vehicle accident or something like that. There you go. Now, we have an old saying that about the time you think that an oral product like a gummy or a lozenge or a, or a brownie doesn't work is about the time it starts working. So just be patient. <laughs> just be cool when you're being able to do that. There are famous stories about that that go on out there. So routes of administration are very, very important. So what's the bottom line, Greg? I think it's, it's, it's interesting when you look at medical cannabis. Now, sleep duration, sleep is important for and, and both duration and quality for your health. Well, everybody's got to know that there is no substitute for sleep. And so when you look at those tables of like how much sleep do, for somebody my age is important, you know, the way they figured that out for an adult at eight hours a night, it's like if you look at people that are sleeping less than four hours a night and the people sleeping more than 12 hours a night, for whatever reason, are dying off faster than the guys at eight hours a night. So yeah. that's why they came up with a, hey, we should recommend that you get eight hours a night. You could be a short sleeper. You could be a long sleeper. And that's still healthy and that's still okay for you. But just keep in mind, less than four and more than 12 is not good. And you should look into what could be going on in your system, especially if you don't feel right during the day. Right. And I do want to point out that there are studies being done on medical marijuana and sleep. They're not necessarily being done here in the United States. Most of the studies in the United States are anecdotal, meaning they just are they're taking patients that they find out there and recording what's going on. But a lot of the a lot of those studies are being done, like I mentioned, in Israel, in Canada, in Great Britain, uh, in Germany, in Spain. Uh, the amount of studies are there, and I think that's important. I know a lot of politicians will say oh, we need to we need to get more more research, and we do. There's no question. We also need to remove the barriers to that particular. Research. It does work, but you, you know, always keep in mind to be um, be aware of your circadian cycling downside of the circadian phase with enough sleep pressure to, to uh, built up during the day to fall asleep naturally. But you know, medical marijuana will help push you over the edge, and uh, it's it's just uh, sometimes it's a better way for an acute form of insomnia. That, that's a good point. And, and it is safe. There's no reported deaths, uh, uh, overdose or, or deaths from cannabis, both either recreationally or medically. Um, I do want to point out, as I mentioned earlier, we did do a optimizing, understanding and optimizing sleep video. You can find it here on our, on our YouTube channel. Um, so please tune in. And, and if you learn, learn, want to learn more about sleep, please check that out. Greg, any final thoughts? Well, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, too much of anything, including marijuana, medical marijuana, recreational or medicinal, uh, especially for insomnia, is to take a look to see if there's something that you can straighten out behaviorally. And you could look at sleep hygiene online and find a lot of things that you could do better. And if there is some kind of pathology going on, sleep apnea, undiagnosed, untreated, uh, chronic pain, you know, sometimes you have to look at that and treat the underlying condition to sleep better. Medical marijuana for insomnia has its place. Insomnia is the, the largest kind of sleep pathology, like 
anywhere, especially in Western countries. So uh, getting better sleep without any kind of medication is something that we should all work towards, but med medical marijuana is safe and safe to use on occasion. And one of the steps to getting there is really using medical marijuana as a safe way of, of, of heading in that particular direction. Yes, uh, it, it relieves in anxiety and it could help with a lot of different things. So I do believe that. Greg, thank you very much for the assistance on this video. And I want to thank everybody for watching. Uh, please feel free to check out our social media channels, uh, the YouTube videos. they be able to get more information, not just about sleep, but other conditions. And then also check out our weekly medical marijuana aware videos. Uh, every Wednesday, we put out a video on various conditions and how med medical marijuana can help. So we look forward to you joining us. And thank you very much for watching this particular video.